Hi, I'm Scott Patton. I just want to thank you for watching our online service today. My goal is to give you an expeditionary journey through God's Word, through expository preaching. And when you get one of our sermons here, we're going to preach uh, based on the Holy Spirit of God's inspired words, the good, the bad, the ugly. Some things you might like and the Holy Spirit is going to inspire you and some things he's probably going to convict you on. Nonetheless, we're honored that you watch us today. God bless you and go bold. chiefs and they met in buffalo new york and it was called the buffalo council and something fascinating happened the boston missionary society uh gave a gospel presentation to all of these indian chiefs okay uh that met in buffalo new york now the guy that that, that the indian chiefs had in charge of to representing them was a was an Indian chief named Chief Red Jacket. And after the gospel presentation, he said, he said you know, there is, there is, you, you, you white people say there's only one way to worship and serve the great spirit. I'm quoting him here. And there's only one religion. But why do you white people differ so much about it if you believe in the same God and you read the same book? I mean, you let that sink in. Why do we? If you think about it, you see how, 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 we've have, how we have all these different denominations, but, but in the end, in the end, it, we, we all have the same Holy Spirit of God. We all worship the same God. We, we, Jesus Christ is Lord, and we all have the same doctrine, yet a lot of times we can't even agree. We can't even agree in our own denomination, if you think about it. Okay, but there's a reason for that, because I'm going to tell you guys, every single day, there is a war against your soul. There is. Now, depending on where your soul is at, it's going to depend on the soul of your war, the war of your soul, because I will tell you that you're going to see today that, that, that the Apostle Peter is going to go to great lengths to show you how this war ends up in your soul. And here's what I mean by that. If you are a saved person, the, the, the Satan's war against your soul is going to be different than it is a lost person. Okay? And this is what Peter's going to go to great lengths to show us today. Now, when you see this, I want you to think in the back of the mind, what is your battles that you're facing? What is your battles? Because I'm going to tell you that your battles are different than mine, and mine are different than yours. Let's get started and let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. And Father, I just thank you. you answered so, so many prayers for us this week. And this really the last month, we had a lot of people that were sick. And, and you're starting to bring your church back here, Lord. And, and uh, I just thank you. I thank you for the healing that you did because you're the great physician. You've worked some absolute miracles in some, Lord, and we just thank you. But we also know, Lord, that you have called some to you. And I ask that you be with those families that have lost loved ones this week, Lord. And I ask that you would surround them with your most powerful angels. Father, I just pray that, you, that we get a word from, from you today and not from Scott. And I just thank you for the academic rigor and the, and the, and the, uh, the graciousness of the Holy Spirit that these are your words and not mine. And we ask these sayings and all God's people said... Okay, so I want you to take your Bible and open it up to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is where we're going to start today. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and I read God's Word. But you are a chosen generation, a rural priesthood, 
a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim his praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Now, let's just, let's just think about this text just for a second. Because I'm going to tell you guys, this, this verse and this text right here, it is rich. It, I mean, there's a, you, could, you could almost write a book on this one verse here. It is very, very rich, and I'm going to tell you, this is fascinating when you see it. This is very fascinating when you see it. This is a rich text. But remember our sermon from last week when we talked about, when we talked about Peter goes to great lengths on how we are chosen, how we are chosen by God. And he goes to great lengths to say that you're special because you were chosen. Now, here's what I want you to do. remember. Remember back in the Old Testament, and you're going to see these analogies many times. You're going to see God use Israel uh, as analogies. Okay, because you guys, you guys remember, he chose the people of Israel. He didn't choose the people of Israel because they had a bunch of great guys or they had great food or they could do something for him. He chose them because he loved them, just like he does us, just like he does us. And you remember what John, John said in chapter 15, verse 16, we did not choose him, rather he chose us. But I want you to look at something here. We talked about the royal priesthood last week, and I'm not going to retread that ground. But what I do want you to look at right now is a holy nation. I want you to look at this phrase right here, and what does that mean? It doesn't mean the United States of America. It's not a reference to any nation here on earth, but this is in reference to the holy nation, which is the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Remember, our citizenship is in heaven. And this is what's so fascinating about Peter and the older part of his life. He, keep, he, keep, he keeps going back to saying that we're part of God's, God's creation and we're a part of the kingdom of God and we're not part of any nation here on earth. Okay, remember our citizenship is heaven. I find it so interesting that you're going to see Peter keep going back to this. Because you remember what it says in Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly await our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing, folks. The day that you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we have been set apart from everyone else. And that's just a fact. That's how it is. But I want you to look at these next words that he says here. His, he's talking about Jesus, his own special people. Now, what I want you to look now, now we become the special people. The day that, that, that Chris and David were saved by Jesus Christ, they became special to him. The day that I was, received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I became special. Everybody that has accepted that grace, who has had that mercy, become special. You are very special to God. And I want you to look at that. Because now what happens, now we become people of God and not become people of Satan. Now, we are predestined from this point on. And I'm not telling you guys this from like, a lot of times we, we get confused and you, there's so much out there about this whole idea of predestiny, okay? And I'm not a Calvinist, okay, to believe in predestiny. Because here's the thing. Here's what I want you to understand. We are special people to God because all of us, all of us, the day we are born, we are predestined to hell. If you believe that, say amen. We are, every single one of us. But you remember, God chose us, and if we accept that mercy, now we become on a predestined path, okay, that he has for us, all right? And he offers that to everybody. Now, here's the thing. We are special possessions of him. He now has a predestined plan for us because why? He purchased us with his blood all right, and now Peter's telling us because you are really special, you're in this cool predestined club that's, gonna, that's never going to die. You're going to have this for the rest of eternity. Now, because you're special, this comes with enormous responsibility. You are privileged, and I want you to think about this. You are privileged. Your blessing, your blessing because you are privileged comes with great responsibility. Now, because you are in the gate, it becomes a great responsibility. I want you to know, to know this. Did you know that India Homa has some of the highest poverty rates in Oklahoma? It does. Our school has some of the highest poverty rates in Oklahoma. In fact, our school is below the poverty rate for the state, state average when you look at the stats. 
okay? But our poor families and children would be considered rich in 80% of the countries in the world. Let that sink in. Just let that sink in for a second, okay? Now, when I say that, I say that in tongue-in-cheek to a degree because what Peter's referring to him is not richly earthly blessings. Those are all bonuses because we are blessed because we were, we were born here in the United States. I mean, we're so blessed because we live here. Just being born in the United States is like winning the lottery compared to 80% of the other countries in the world. But here's the deal. Peter is saying, Peter's saying, because, because you are a holy nation, because you're own special people, now because you're special and you have this, that you may proclaim praises of him. I want you to let that sink in and understand what he's, he's saying here. You may proclaim praises of him. Proclaim the praises means simply this. You must share the gospel. That's what you must do because you are the chosen special people on this predestined plan now that you're going to have eternity. Death will never touch you. So what, Jesus, what Peter's saying here is, no, you may not be called to be a preacher. No, you may not be called uh, to be a missionary. But whatever God has called you to do, whether it's working at Goodyear, whether it's uh, teaching school, whether it's being in the Army, whether it's being a cop, it's being a fireman, whatever that is, you have the responsibility to praise Him. You have a responsibility to praise Him and others. Do you believe that your neighbor or your neighbor's children deserve the chance to be special people? Think about that. Think about your neighbor's kids. Are they special? Do they deserve to be special? Do you have empathy for them if they're not, if, for the, for, if they're not special people? You say, well, what do I do? Well, it's really simple. You praise them. How do we praise them in the 21st century church? We invite kids to Wednesday night. We invite families to church. We get kids to False Creek, as, as many as we possibly can. We go and we check on our neighbors. We bring food to families. We put our arms around somebody that's just had a really hard time, and we pray with them and say, it's going to be okay. You see, this is how we praise him, because now we are in this special club, guys. We're in this special club. And if you haven't been doing that and you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now, it's Scott Patton's not the one that's making you feel uncomfortable, okay? Because what am I doing? I'm preaching the Bible, all right? And this is a great thing about expository preaching. You have to preach what's in front of you. You see what I mean? I can't go off on a tangent because I didn't write these words. Peter did, and the Holy Spirit inspired him, okay? So ask yourself, what can I do because I am chosen, because I'm special? What can I do to praise, to praise him? How do I praise him? Because here's what he's going to do. Here's, here's what he's going to show us here. Why is he making a big deal out of this? Because why? He called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. He called you out of that darkness. You see, you weren't special. You didn't do anything to deserve this. Not one thing to deserve this. In fact, I'm going to have you guys do an experiment tonight. I want you to go into your bedroom with all the lights off, with all the shades uh, closed, all the curtains closed, all right? I want you to walk in there, and just when it's dark, and I want you to feel in that, and when it's dark in your bedroom, I want you to feel how intense that dark is. Have you ever just sat there in the dark? and you can't hardly see your hand in front of your face, I want you to feel the intensity of that darkness. And then what I want you to do in this experiment, I want you to turn on your light. All right? And then I want you to count how many seconds it takes for the light to absolutely destroy the darkness. I bet you can't even get to one. What do you bet? Because here's the thing. When God called us out of the darkness, the power of the Holy Spirit will change your life forever. It does. Because the light, he, he puts that marvelous light on you. He puts that marvelous light on you. All right? He puts that marvelous light. 
And when you get called out of the darkness with the power of the Holy Spirit, His light changes you forever. It changes you forever. He called you out of the darkness into this marvelous light. This is a very common metaphor that we see here in the, in the Old Testament or the New Testament. But it started in the, New, in the Old Testament. You can look in the second verse of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, when God said, let there be light. Guess what? The light just keeps going, guys. The universe just keeps expanding. It hasn't stopped. It hasn't stopped since he said that in Genesis. A beautiful metaphor. A very beautiful metaphor. I want you to go to verse 10 here. Let's go to the next verse, Caleb. Who once were not a people, but now have the people of God who have not obtained mercy, but who have now have obtained mercy. I want you to think about this. I shared a meme on Facebook. I think it was yesterday. And I got some blowback on it. That's not uncommon. Uh, but here's what it said, and I can't remember the, the pastor that I'm quoting here. But he said simply this. He said, those who are in hell deserve to be in hell. Those in heaven don't deserve to be in heaven. Do you believe that? I mean, that's true. I mean, those in hell deserve to be in hell, and those in heaven do not deserve to be in heaven. And what this preacher was basically saying he said the first one is justice, the second one is grace. Amen? And that's what mercy is. That's what mercy is. See, we don't deserve his mercy. We don't deserve any of it. Scott Patton doesn't deserve one iota of this mercy. Okay? Because here's the thing. If you have not retained this mercy from the blood of Jesus Christ, all right, we would be lost and we would be on our way to hell. We would be. I'm reminded, I'll go back to the Old Testament, and God always uses the people of Israel as his metaphors. And how many times did you see God deliver Israel? Out of the bondage of Pharaoh and Egypt, just for example. So he expected Israel to serve and glorify him. And what would Israel do? They would kind of forget that he took them out of bondage and out of that Pharaoh. They would forget all about that. But if you think about it, we're the same way, right? Scott Patton's the same way. Did, not, did God not deliver me from the bondage of a lost and dying world? Did not God deliver you from a lost and dying world? He did deliver you. Guys, I remember when, uh, I just want you to remember this. We're living in enemy territory. The world belongs to Satan. God intentionally did that. The world belongs to Satan, okay? We are living in enemy territory. I'll never forget the first time I crossed into enemy territory, February 2nd, 1991. I was on a helicopter with the 101st Airborne, and we crossed in to, to do our attack into Iraq. And I knew this, the time that we crossed into that. I knew where the border was, okay? And you can see the Constantina wire there. And we flew into Iraq, there was something about being in enemy territory that just stuck with me. Like, wow, I've read about this when I was a kid. I've thought about this a million times, and now I'm in enemy territory. But here's what I want you guys to understand. You're in enemy territory today, okay, because you are a part of the kingdom of God. You're not a part of this world, all right? And I want you to understand that. We've, we, we were on a rescue mission to get the lost out of the enemy territory. we got to get the lost into the kingdom of God. You understand that? Because our, our, this is part of our service in the army of the Lord. We have the kryptonite to defeat Satan, and his name's the Holy Spirit. And he's a part of us. He lives in us. Why don't you go to verse 11? He says something really, really cool. I want everybody to say beloved with me. Go ahead and say it. Now, this is an awesome, awesome word, beloved. So Peter is talking to his congregation. He said, beloved, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from this fleshly lust which wars against your soul. Beloved. Man, that's an affectionate term. It's like family and friends. 
because we are beloved. Every one of you in this church is beloved to me. And I will just tell you guys right now, I would die for every one of you in a minute because you're beloved. You would die for your children because they're beloved. It's an affectionate term that we only give to family and friends. And Peter's referring to his congregation here. He's reminding him that we are beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are inspired by the same Holy Ghost. We, we read the same Bible. We study the same Bible. This is what it is. I find it fascinating that Peter keeps going back to what? Sojourners and pilgrims. What's a sojourner? It's somebody visiting from another part, right? A pilgrim. Remember what the pilgrims were? They were from England. They came over here. You're sojourners. That means that you're not part of this world. He's reminding them that the citizenship again is in heaven. He, go, he keeps going back there. Why? Why does he keep doing that? Because here's the thing. Where your citizenship is is where you share your assumptions, your values, and your beliefs. You share your customs. I'm going to tell you guys. I've said this, I think, to J.D. and several people and Don. And we have more theologically in common at FBC Indiahoma with the Post Oak Church and the Church of Christ than we do a lot of Baptist churches across the country. I'm just telling you, we do. It's unfortunate, but it's just the truth. Okay? And you guys have, might have heard me use this analogy before, and if I, if I have, I apologize. When Tammy and I were stationed in Europe, I think four or five years one of the fascinating things that we learned really fast about Europe was Europe is separated by their language. So you have people that speak French. Sie sprechen Sie Deutsch in Germany and in England, right? Okay, then you have Spain, and they speak Spanish. Or Brooklyn used to get confused and say sprechen Sie British. Remember that, Tammy, when she used to say that instead of say, one of the things you, you say to German people, you say, sie sprechen sie Deutsch, or sie sprechen sie English, okay? And so uh, they would speak English to you, okay? Well, Brooklyn came up to a lady one time, sprechen British? <laughs> so anyway, that was pretty cool. But what I'm saying is, Europe is separated by their languages, okay? But they're on the same continent, but they're separated by their languages, but here's the thing. Here's what's fascinating about Europe. They all kind of have the same assumptions, values, and beliefs. They may have a different language. But here's what's fascinating about the United States. We are united by our language, but I want to tell you something, guys. We are vastly separated by our assumptions, values, and beliefs here in the United States. And it is getting that, 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 that gulf is getting wider and wider every day. I can tell you guys, I, this is why I use that, that analogy at the first, first of the sermon. A Baptist church in Massachusetts looks a lot different than any home of First Baptist. I'll just tell you, it does. And again, our assumptions, values, beliefs. This is why I went back to the Indian chiefs, and they asked that profound question about, will you guys have the same Holy Spirit and same Bible? Why are you separated? Why are you separated? It's because where you share your citizenship, your, your customs, your beliefs, Beloved, I, 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 as, I, as I beg you as sojourners, we're all in this together. We have the same Holy Spirit of God. But I want you to see what he put, puts in here in this next part of this verse here. He's telling you, abstain from fleshly lust. Now, when you look at, that, look at those four words, we, take, we, we, we tend to think of this verse as, you know, probably adultery, pornography, uh, some type of sexual sin homosexuality, something of that nature. We're thinking of that. But I'm going to tell you guys, these four words are a lot bigger than fleshly lust of sex. He's referring to such desires as ambition, money, power. You ever think about that? Being zealous, being jealous. Those are fleshly lust. Do you follow me? The behavior of a fallen peeper should never be the standard of a dark world. Now think about this. The behavior of the fallen people of a dark world should never be the standard of right and wrong. 
I was having a theological discussion with somebody the other day, and it talks about the Overton window. And politicians like to use this thing called the Overton window. So if you have the scale on what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, and the politician will create an Overton window, he said, yeah, that's probably acceptable over here, and I'm just going to stay right in the middle here. Okay? But here's, what, here's what's happened in America, and it's also happened in the church. That Overton window, it's moved way over here. You see what I'm saying? What's acceptable that wasn't acceptable in 1970 or 1980. You see what I mean? So, so, so if, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if that's your norm, if that's your base, you need to think hard about it because here's what's happening. Okay? We cannot be defined in a dark world by right or wrong. We have to let God's world do this. Gigantic issues in the church today even after people are saved. Because here's what's happened. We still have people that are saved. They're taking their marching orders from the culture. And that's the fundamental problem with America's church today. And like I said last week, we are far too much American and we're not church. If you believe that, say amen. We're far too much American culture. And that's my fundamental problem right now with the problems we're having in the, in the Southern Baptist Convention and our seminaries. The embracement of critical race theory and intersectionality is the antithesis of the gospel, but it's not just the SBC churches. It's, it's the Methodist church. It's, it's Presbyterians. It's all of it. Because here's what I'll tell you guys. This is what I'm talking about into the world. Social justice is not a gospel issue. It's not Jesus plus is a gospel. It's not Jesus plus this is a gospel. No, it's Jesus. If you believe that, say amen. It's Jesus. But what is it, what is, remember what Paul said. Do not be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing your mind. How do we get a renewed mind? We get in God's book and not Facebook. We do what God approves of and not what man's. This is how we stay. This is how we stay grounded. But I want you to look at this, and this is the whole thesis of the sermon. Which These lusts which war against the soul. I want you to think about this for a second. The human soul is endangered of being destroyed root and branch. Is it not? Because if you just look at the fundamental problem of the world, we just really got one problem in the world. You know what it is? It's death. It's death. And, and it doesn't have to be. You see, if we have that light, if we accepted that grace, Death doesn't have to be upon us. Death does not have to be on our children. Death does not have to be on our neighbors. Death is the number one problem, but nobody wants to talk about it. Because here's what's happened. If the soul <laughs> is not saved, the soul dies. If the soul is saved, the soul lives. The war waged against the soul in this world. What wars against your soul? I want you, I'm asking everybody in here. What wars against your soul? I'm going to tell you, every, one of, every single one of you have a war against your soul right now. Where's your battle in life today? Where is it taking you? What that battle is. Because I'm going to tell you, I have a war against my soul. I've got my struggles. Yeah. They're different than yours. They're different than Tammy's. They're different than Chris. They're different than Cassie's. My struggles are different. And I'm going to tell you also, guys, my struggles are different than they were 10 years ago. It depends on the season, that, that life that you're in. Okay? It does. Because you have a war against your soul. And I'm not talking about salvation. You see, that's why I told you at the first of the sermon today, the war of your soul is a little bit different between saved people and lost people. Because Satan's war against the lost people is he wants to keep them lost. He wants to keep them in the dark. The war against the saved people, okay, is to prevent you from shining that big flashlight. Amen? Satan doesn't want you shining that light. He doesn't want you sharing the gospel. He doesn't want you, he doesn't want you to invite somebody into the kingdom. He doesn't want you to witness to somebody. He doesn't want you to talk about the light. Satan knew that he didn't have my soul when I was a drunk. He knew that my soul belonged to Jesus, even though I was living in sin. But you know what he did? 
He loved to keep me on the sidelines. Did he not? He loved to keep me in poker tournaments, drinking cases of beer on Thursday nights and Saturday nights. Why? Because I wasn't sharing the gospel on those nights in the prisons. I wasn't able to come in here and preach on a Sunday morning. Satan's war is successful. Souls are lost in hell forever, and that's how he does it. That's what it is. But remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, what will profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his soul? For what can man can give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 18. If the lost soul is a lost person, and there's no way to negotiate it back, you can't, you can't get that back. Once that soul is lost, once that soul is, goes into that other Rubicon, it's lost forever. You can't go in there and do a rescue mission. You can't bring it back. Once you cross into that domain, a lot of times I'll ask the high school kids, think about what happens to you five seconds after you die. Ask yourself that question, five seconds after you die. Ask yourself the question, what happens? Because you can't go back. You can't go back and say, you know, um, I really, I've changed my mind now. Jesus, I really want your grace. I really want your mercy. I really want your love. You can't go back. You want you cross into that domain. You remember the parallel in Luke's gospel, the parable, Luke's gospel, where he said, the rich man went to hell and the poor man, Lazarus, not the Lazarus from the tomb, but a different Lazarus. When he gained the greatest wealth, the poor man uh, did not have anything on earth. But once he went to heaven, he had the greatest wealth of all time, eternal life. And remember what the rich man? He was agonizing in hell, and he cried out, and I'm quoting here in Scripture, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to death, the tip of his finger, in water to cool my tongue, because I am this agony of fire, Luke 16, 24. It would go on to say in the book of Luke, there's a great gulf fixed that no one can cross from the other side, from heaven to hell, Luke 16, 26. If the dark side forces win this war on this soul, it's lost forever and ever and ever. You can never take it back. Death is a problem. It's not climate change. It's not Amicron. It's not the Delta variant. It's not COVID-19. Death is a problem. It affects everybody, and it always affects everybody without exception. It affects everybody in a serious way. Yet our world, our world, does not give one iota of a serious problem to this. You won't hear any stories on the mainstream media. There's no public service announcement. There's nothing trending on social media about it. There's no sound bites. And as we close in our last verse here, in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, he says, conduct, having your conduct honorable among Gentiles, when they speak to you as evildoers, may they be good works which observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know, I think it's fascinating that Peter's telling us to keep, keep our conduct honorable. Honorable is a pretty cool word in the Bible, honor your father and mother. And like I've told you guys before, it is so easy to try to act like Jesus, but Trying to react like him is really, really hard. It is. You can just watch me at a basketball game sometime. <laughs> you saw Les's post. I said, I'm with you, Les. Sometimes our reactions aren't honorable. Speak against evildoers. Is your actions honorable sometimes in road rage? Guys, we are involved in the spiritual warfare and I'm going to tell you folks the fight is real it's real and the stakes they're a whole lot higher than Taiwan or the Crimean and Russia right now our real fight and I want you guys to remember this as we close here because it's, it affects everybody in this room my fight is not against the people in this world and if you think about it, Satan is our enemy and the demons are our enemy, but they're not the real enemy. And I'm going to paraphrase a great D.L. Moody here. I have more trouble with Scott Patton 
than I do any man. You have more trouble with yourself than you do with anybody else. And that's what the war against the soul is. That's what it is. It's against you. Sometimes we're our worst enemies. With every head bowed and all eyes closed. Father in heaven, if there's somebody who has not received your grace, has never taken that step to say, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. I, I want to live with you forever. I know the Holy Spirit's presence in this room is powerful. Let them know that it's really simple. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God, and He did indeed arise on that third day. And they commit to Him forever. If you've never prayed that prayer before, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I'm going to have an invitation here, and I'm going to offer it to you. Father, we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.